And now, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 30-7, uh, the House will now proceed with consideration of Bill 560 under private members' business. Orders of the day. Private members' business, resuming consideration of second reading of Bill C-560, and <laughs> the Divorce Act Equal Parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts, standing in the name of Mr. Bellicott. Resuming debate, uh, please for the debat. L'Honorable Deputy du Honorable Member for Etobicoke North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Bill C-560, an act to amend the Divorce Act, equal parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by first saying my heart goes out to all those struggling through the breakup of a marriage, divorce, in court cases for custody and wanting more time with their children. Let me also say that while I appreciate the terrible anguish of parents who want to spend more time with their children and the mover of the bill's intent, namely to have two caring, engaged, and loving parents in children's lives, I believe the bill is fundamentally flawed in putting parental rights before the rights of children, the most precious and vulnerable amongst us. Mr. Speaker, the former Conservative Minister of Justice and Attorney General, in speaking to the Canadian Bar Association's annual conference in 2009 about equal parenting and the predecessor to this bill, namely Bill C-422, stated, quote, the best interests of the child are always paramount and should be, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-560 was introduced by the Member of Parliament for Saskatoon with Pasquin on December 12, 2013. This is not the first time the Honourable Member has introduced a bill regarding this matter. The most significant changes that the bill would bring to the Divorce Act include the following. Removing the current definition of custody from the Divorce Act and replacing it with parenting defined as, quote, the act of assuming the role of a parent to a child, including custody and all the rights and responsibilities commonly and historically associated with the role of a parent, end of quote, creating a presumption that, uh, quote, allocating parenting time equally between the spouses is in the best interest of a child, end of quote, and that, quote, equal parental responsibility is in the best interest of a child, end of quote. Adding factors that courts must consider in making custody orders and altering the law on parental mobility. Mr. Speaker, the bill would represent a disservice both to children and families by taking the focus away from children in favor of parental rights, detracting from the individual justice required by the Divorce Act and promoting further and more fractious litigation. Mr. Speaker, the Divorce Act currently established that the best interest of the child is the paramount consideration in child custody cases. In other words, the rights of the parent are subordinate to the interests of the child. Bill C-560 seeks to weaken this in favor of the rights of the parents. Mr. Speaker, the best interest of the child test has been a fundamental part of most legislation relating to children for many years. It is used in federal legislation under the following acts, Citizenship Act, Divorce Act, Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and Youth Criminal Justice Act. It is also used in some provincial legislation dealing with matters such as adoption legislation, child protection legislation, and custody access and child support for unmarried couples. Mr. Speaker, equal parenting as defined in the bill appears to have received support from some observers, particularly certain parents groups, but so far it has not received much support from the legal community. The Canadian Bar Association, or CBA, represents some 37,000 lawyers, judges, notaries, law teachers and law students from across Canada. The CBA's mandate includes improvement in the law and the administration of justice. The CBA family law section includes family lawyers from every part of the country. They are collaborative arbitrators, litigators, mediators, 
parenting coordinators and practitioners. Their clients include children, fathers, mothers, grandparents, step-parents, surrogates, etc. Mr. Speaker, the CBA family section believes that any discussion of, quote, parental rights is misguided when resolving arrangements for children and that the sole focus must be what is best for children. The CBA therefore opposes Bill C-560 as it would shift the way custody is determined under the Divorce Act to parents' rights, away from what is in the best interests of children. Mr. Speaker, lawyers assist all family members during what are often impossibly difficult times in restructuring their responsibilities and arrangements following separation and divorce. As a result, the CBA family section sees the issue from all sides. The CBA firmly believes that the only perspective to foster outcomes that are best for children is to require that the courts and parents focus solely on the children's interests in making decisions. Mr. Speaker, while the bill refers to equal parenting, it would not actually advance equality. Rather, it would change the primary focus in custody and access matters from what is best for children to equal parental rights. Mr. Speaker, quote, parenting is not about adults claiming rights, end of quote, says Patricia Baer of Edmonton, vice chair of CBA's National Family Law Section, quote, it is about the desire and ability to put children's interests first, end of quote. She continues, quote, the bill is based on the faulty assumption that equal parenting time will work for all families, regardless of abilities, circumstances, needs, history, changes, or attitudes of all those involved. In reality, the proposed change is clearly about promoting parents' views of equality at the expense of the interests of children who are affected by their parents' separation, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, the CBA agrees that shared parenting is a good outcome for many families, where equal time and responsibility can be shown to be in the best interests of children. Judges can and do make that order under the current law, but the CBA understands that one size does not fit all. Mr. Speaker, the CBA objects to the proposed legislation, which says equal parenting time and responsibility must be ordered in every case. This would require judges to justify any other outcome by ruling that the best interests of the child would be substantially enhanced by a non-equal regime. This clearly makes children's interests a very low priority, which is contradictory to the stated goals of the Canadian family laws, as well as Canada's obligations under the Hague Convention on the Rights of the Child. Mr. Speaker, finally, I would like to bring forth questions asked by my friend and colleague, the Honourable Member for Charlottetown, of the current Justice Minister regarding Bill C-560 at the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. My colleague asked, quote, a private member's bill is coming before the House, C-560, dealing with the Divorce Act. Back in 2009, your predecessor indicated that the best interests of the child are always paramount. Given that this question is about to come before the House, what are your views on that, sir? The Justice Minister answered, quote, I can tell you, having practiced some family laws you have in Prince Edward Island, that the long-held legal maximum and jurisprudence definitely supports that the best interests of the child will remain the primary concern. I see no change in that regard, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, in closing, children must always be our primary concern. This legislation seeks to weaken that. This is not acceptable to the Liberal Party of Canada. This is not acceptable to the Canadian Bar Association. This is not acceptable to the present Minister of Justice or to the former Minister of Justice. This is why we will oppose the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presenting debate, the Honourable Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to speak on Bill C-560, an act to amend the Divorce Act, equal parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts. 
The preamble to this bill states a number of objectives, including to encourage divorcing parents to take more responsibility for their disputes with less reliance on the adversarial processes. I would like to focus my remarks on the stated objective of the bill in order to demonstrate how this concept is consistent with our government's current approach to divorce and matrimonial settlements. We all know that divorce is often a messy and drawn out process where both sides have deeply rooted resentments towards one another. Unfortunately, at times, divorce is unavoidable and happens quite frequently in our society. However, rather than turning to the courts and other adversarial processes to find a neat and tiny solution to an otherwise complex and messy situation, our government has taken the approach of encouraging and supporting both sides to find a mutually agreed upon resolution themselves. In the context of separation and divorce, when parents are able to work together and put their children's needs and interests first, they provide a supportive environment for their children during an often challenging time. This is an important step in allowing these kids to achieve their full potential. Working together and minimizing conflict are important and necessary goals for the approximately 70,000 married couples who divorce in Canada each year. While the government cannot support Bill 560 as it moves away from a strong focus on the best interests of the child, I thought it would be helpful, Mr. Speaker, to outline for my colleagues some of the ways in which this government is already promoting the goal of encouraging parents to take more responsibility for the resolution of their disputes. Firstly, this government contributes funding to a wide range of family justice services that have been shown to support cooperation and minimize conflict. Secondly, this government has developed various publications to help families deal with divorce, including a booklet for children to help them understand and cope with their parents' divorce, and a parenting guide and tools that encourage parent parents to cooperate with each other and help them prepare a parenting plan that will best suit the needs of their children. The phrase family justice services refers to all programs and services that meaningfully contribute to the resolution of family law issues. Those to which this government contributes funding include information and resource centers, alternative dispute resolution services, parent and child education programs, and services directed at high conflict situations. Here is a brief description of each type. Information and resource centers offer free information on family law and court procedures. As a general rule, these centers do not give legal advice. However, they give out necessary information and documents such as court forms and provide some guidance on the steps in legal proceedings. They also refer families to legal and community resources to help meet their needs. An alternative dispute resolution process, which is widely funded by governments, is mediation. A mediator is a neutral third party who helps the parents discuss issues on which they disagree. The mediator does not take sides, but may make suggestions to help the parents communicate better and reach an agreement. The mediator does not replace a lawyer. Parent education and information programs are usually run by lawyers and social workers. They often work together to help parents understand and cope with the emotional effects of separation and divorce on themselves and their children. They deal with some of the challenges of parenting post-separation and learn techniques for communicating better with each other, resolving disputes, and co-parenting. Some of these programs are also available on government websites and in other formats. This helps to make them more accessible to those living in remote areas. Some provinces and territories have developed special education and counseling programs for children which help them cope emotionally with the breakdown of their family and to understand that their parents' divorce is not their fault. Finally, there are family justice services designed to help in situations where there are concerns about the safety of children and the other parent. As a key example of this, service providers, generally with social work experience, supervise visits between a parent and a child. Or they may supervise the transfer of a child from one parent to another where, the, where there is a high degree of conflict between the parents. I would like to emphasize that all these programs and services are developed and administered by the provinces and territories. As many of you are aware, the federal and provincial and territorial governments share constitutional responsibility for family law and the administration of justice is a provincial territorial responsibility. The federal government is responsible for divorce, including custody and support, when dealt with as part of the divorce. In all other situations, the provincial and territorial governments are responsible for custody and support. Since 1985, the federal government has provided funds to provinces and territories to develop and improve services and programs that assist separating and divorcing families. The current funding program, entitled the Supporting Families Fund, has two objectives. 
one, to contribute to the continued improvement to access to the family justice system, and two, to encourage greater parental compliance with family obligations, notably support and parenting arrangements. To fulfill these objectives, the fund was rec recently renewed for three years until 2017 to provide $15.5 million per year to the provinces and territories for the delivery of family justice services that help parents resolve their issues and comply with their family obligations for the benefit of their children. The fund also provides $500,000 per year to non-governmental organizations to develop highly targeted family justice information and training resources. By helping to reduce conflict and increase cooperation between parents, these family justice services promote better outcomes for children. The second way in which this government supports the goals of cooperation in minimizing conflict is to make available on the government website information and other tools that can help children cope with divorce and parents develop parenting arrangements that respond to the needs of their children. The government recognizes that children need information as well as adults and developed What Happens Next, a booklet for children between the ages of 9 to 12 whose parents are separating or divorcing. It gives them basic explanations of key legal terms and also discusses the emotions that they may be feeling. The children's calendar helps children keep track of their schedule and important dates as they move between houses. The guide entitled Making Plans gives parents information about issues they need to address when developing parenting arrangements, including a schedule for the time children will be under the care of each parent. It also suggests processes that parents can use to agree on a plan, such as mediation, negotiation, and collaborative law, and provides tips on how to include their child's perspective. This guide promotes agreement between parents by emphasizing the importance of communicating, reducing conflict, and building a, co a cooperating relationship that focuses on the best interests of the child. The Parenting Plan Tool is a companion to making plans. It is a practical guide with sample clauses to help parents develop a written parenting plan setting out their parenting arrangement. Finally, the federal government worked with our colleagues in the provinces and territories to develop a parenting plan checklist to help parents identify issues to consider when developing a parenting plan. Mr. Speaker, the need for public legal education and information materials such as these as well as for family justice services is widely recognized. Recently, the Action Committee on Access to Civil and Family Justice, a group broadly representative of leaders across Canada in the field of civil and family justice and chaired by the Supreme Court of Canada Justice Thomas Cromwell, emphasized the value of front-end services such as those family justice services funded by this government and especially those that include live help. It noted that it is widely recognized that the provision of services early in a dispute helps to minimize both the cost and duration of the dispute and thus to mitigate the possibility of protracted conflict and a corresponding harm to family relationships. The committee were equally, equally adamant that the more that families can effectively take responsibility for the resolution of their own disputes, the better. However, this push towards family autonomy must be balanced by a corresponding public obligation to ensure that these families are given appropriate help in doing so. I want to reassure the House, Mr. Speaker, that we take the public obligation seriously. That is why I have taken the time to explain today some of the ways that we are contributing to high-quality front-end services that support the many Canadian families experiencing family breakdown. I have highlighted the Supporting Families Fund and the development of public legal education and information materials. Further, the government will review the custody and access provisions of the Divorce Act, and in doing so, will consider how it can further encourage parents to rely less on adversarial processes and focus on the needs of their children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Halifax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thanks very much. I'm ready. So this bill that we have before us, um, I went to law school, I went to Dalhousie Law School, and I started in 2001. And when I was there, in my second year, I got to take family law with the great Rolly Thompson, uh, one of the foremost thinkers on family law in Canada. Uh, if he's watching right now, he's laughing, laughing out loud at home because I said that. But he is. He's a great thinker when it comes to family law. And I was really lucky to have a, a class, to be able to take that class with him. And one of the main, one thing that he drilled into our heads over and over and over again, yes, it's the law, but he made sure we fully understood what it meant, and that was the best interests of the child. 
Uh, and, and we talked about all different scenarios and we talked about different hypotheticals and what would you do? You have this case in front of you. You're a judge. How do you make that decision? And we talked about the best interest of the child because when it comes to conflict about custody and access in Canada, the paramount guiding principle under the Divorce Act and also in many of our pieces of provincial legislation under custody and access legislation, the paramount guiding principle is the best interest of the child. What does that mean? It doesn't mean mom. It doesn't mean dad. It doesn't mean grandparents. It's the best interest of the child. And I point out that it also doesn't mean children. Children uh, across the board. And that was a tricky thing for us to understand as law students. It wasn't what is the best for the children writ large? It was this child in front of you, this child who stood before you, who had a, a specific case, a specific family situation in a, in a different geographic area of Canada, different, all kinds of different <coughs> considerations, socioeconomic considerations, and it is about this child who is before us. And when we consider the best interests of this child who stands before us, there can be many different possibilities under the legislation. There can be um, equal time. Equal time is allowed under the Divorce Act. There can be sole custody by one parent with access by another parent. There can be sole custody by one parent and no access because maybe it is determined that in the best interests of this child, they should not have contact with a parent. There's all kinds of circumstances where that occurs. Shared custody is an option as well. And it is even possible to have a scenario where a child has a different set of circumstances than their sibling. So again, back to this idea, it's not about what is best for children. It is this child, not his or her brother, his or her sister, this child. And you know, it, it goes back to the idea that the most important thing that we are considering is this child who is standing before us. And that is the root of the law when we look at family law and we look at how we deal with custody and access. And I think it is beautiful. It's elegant. It's an elegant concept uh, that, that we go back. Let's forget about who lives where and who has more money or anything like that. What, what's the best scenario for this child? So the bill that's before us would instruct judges to find a presumption of equal sharing of parenting responsibilities. And this could be rebutted. It's a rebuttable pre presumption if uh, the other party or if a party can show that the best interest of the child would, otherwise, would be, quote, substantially enhanced to do otherwise. So even if I thought this bill was a good idea or, or changing this presumption, creating this rebuttable presumption, even if I thought that was a good idea, and I don't, and I'll explain why later. But even if I did, this is a significant departure from Canadian family law. Significant departure. Even if I thought this was a good idea, in no way could anyone think that something as significant as this concept, this reversal, this rebuttable presumption, no one could possibly think that this should be changed through a private member's bill. I know I'm talking process here, but process is important. For people who are at home, not everybody knows private members' legislation, uh, it's different. It, it gets very limited debate. There's two hours at second reading. There's maybe a, a couple of days of committee, and you think, oh, a couple of days, that's big. But no, a committee meeting is just two hours. And then there's two hours at third reading. So we're talking about four hours of debate in this house. That, you know, the best interest of the child is the cornerstone of our Federal Divorce Act. It's the cornerstone of our, of our custody and access laws provincially. It's also part of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is something to which Canada is a signatory. And we can't possibly think that changing this concept would be, it would be sufficient to have four hours of debate. I mean, look, it's me. I'm, I'm speaking to this bill. The mover of the bill is speaking to this bill. There's a smattering of other MPs who are speaking tonight. That's it. We're just going to have this four hours of debate, and we are going to – we can't think that there's enough thought or insight or discussion here tonight that, that could uh, support this fundamental change to family law. So, but that's in the make-believe world where I think this is a good decision. Um, I don't support this bill. I don't support it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, thanks in large part to the, the constant drilling of best interests of the child by Rolly Thompson, my, my family law prof. Um, this is the most important concept. I'm going to quote the Canadian Bar Association here. 
The bill would represent a disservice to both, both to children and families by taking the focus away from children in favor of parental rights, by detracting from the individual justice required by the Divorce Act, and by promoting further and more fractious litigation. Ah, litigation. Um, so we often hear about uh, we need to change the, uh, the Divorce Act. We need to just change this idea of best interest of the child because there's all this litigation and it's so difficult. Well, it is difficult. Of course it's difficult. But there are lots of avenues for parents to take so that they don't actually have to resort to litigation. And when the focus is on the best interests of the child, it makes parents take stock for a minute. Mm -hmm. It makes them take a deep breath and focus on their children rather than themselves. And with this concept, they are more likely to put aside their differences. They are more likely to put aside their self-interest and to work to a resolution that works for their family. This bill would actually make that consideration of the child secondary. You can't support a law that's going to make the child second. Now, in coming up to this debate, I was contacted by a constituent of mine, and he asked me to support this bill. Uh, and he shared a heartbreaking story, a, a truly heartbreaking story of his situation with his ex-partner and, uh, and kids, ex-spouse and kids. And he told me about how uh, sole custody was used as a weapon against him uh, and held out as a reward uh, for his ex-spouse. And we are contacted often by people who want us to support legislation or to not support it, to vote for or against. But the, his story really did stick with me. It's, it's a, it, was a, it was a very difficult story to read. But in looking at his situation, and there are always individual situations that don't, that don't fit or somehow don't work, but when I looked and he told me about everything that he had gone through, I couldn't help but think about how much different his situation would be if we had support for parents, if we had access to justice, if people could actually access the courts and have legal rep uh, representation. I think that the goal of this bill, which is co-parenting, it would be better served by greater funding for parental education, for access to justice, for access to legal representation, to counseling services. It would be better served by those things than it would by this bill. See, I don't have a lot of time left. I, when, in doing research for this bill, uh, there's a fantastic uh, paper put together by the Canadian Bar Association, uh, and it was about an, for a previous incarnation of this bill. And uh, I remember when, when this bill was first introduced, in, or maybe it wasn't first, but in the last parliament, I was deputy justice critic with uh, my colleague from Windsor Tecumseh, who was justice critic, and, and we met with lots of folks to talk about what the implications of this bill would be. And I will say this CBA discussion paper is fantastic. I wanted to quote from it, but I probably don't have a lot. I'm going to make one quote. I think I've got 30 seconds. Um, they talk about this committee that existed in parliament, a special joint committee on child access, custody, and access. The committee recommended a series of criteria defining the best interests of the child, among which would be the principle that children benefit from consistent, meaningful contact with both parents, except in exceptional cases, such as those where violence has occurred and continues to pose a risk to the child. Whether an equal time-sharing arrangement is in the interest of a particular child would have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis with a full evaluation of the child's and parent's circumstances. And so the committee said that the, the legislation that imposes or presumes joint custody as the automatic arrangement for divorcing families would ignore that this might not be suitable for all families, especially those with a history of domestic violence or very disparate parenting roles. I know my time's up. Thanks for uh, being a little bit lenient, I think. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Vagerville, Wainwright. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to speak this evening to Bill C-560, although, Mr. Speaker, I must admit uh, it's not a fun uh, topic uh, to deal with, and I've certainly uh, had all too many, usually young fathers, uh, come to me in, in, in states of, uh, of depression and desperation because they've been denied access uh, to their child or given very limited access 
to their child because of a divorce and because of a, a bad decision uh, made by the courts and by our justice system. Bill C-560 will amend the Divorce Act to direct the courts to make equal shared parenting the presumptive arrangement for children following divorce of their parents, except in proven cases of abuse or neglect. The key point of this legislation is that when the parents divorce each other, they do not divorce their children. These amendments will keep both parents in the lives of more children in those cases where marriages break down. Bill C-560 requires parents to cooperate in establishing equal shared parenting unless they can make a credible, compelling case that this would not be in the best interest of the child. And I've heard many tonight, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, many lawyers, uh, not all lawyers, but uh, who have said that they favor a system where decisions are made based on the best interest of a child. Well, Mr. Speaker, the simple truth is that a child having both parents is what is in the best interest of the child in most cases. Too often, far too often, cases are being decided by our courts that do not make decisions which are in the best interest of the child. And I, I believe, Mr. Speaker, that the law is an ass, so to speak, in far too many cases. And I've seen the fallout of that, and it isn't fun, Mr. Speaker. And there's nothing, I think, that wrenches at your gut and strikes at your heart in a negative way, uh, more so than a parent, again, usually a young father who's being denied access uh, to their child, Mr. Speaker, for, for no good reason, not because there's any threat to the child, but because of a bad court decision. I believe, Mr. Speaker, this legislation would certainly uh, make, make the outcome positive in far more cases. Just over half of the number of divorcing couples today, Mr. Speaker, make their own arrangements for seeing their children without needing court intervention. For those who do need to use family courts, an equal shared parenting presumption will eliminate a key incentive for acrimonious conflict. It is this conflict, Mr. Speaker, that breaks the heart and, and breaks the will in many cases and also, Mr. Speaker, makes lawyers rich so that it would not, uh, so I, I, of course, I would not be surprised if uh, many lawyers support this, leg leg this uh, proposed legislation. I'm not suggesting, Mr. Speaker, that all lawyers would oppose this just because they'd be denied legal fees. I'm not that crass but certainly I believe that kind of thinking does come into things far too often, Mr. Speaker. Bill C-560 will foster settlements and reduce litigation due to the requirement that a parent seeking primary parent status must establish the best interest of the children, which means the focus under Bill C-560 uh, are substantially enhanced by the disproportionate parenting time. Studies have consistently shown that it is the very existence of custody litigation itself that causes the most harm to children. Bill C-560 focuses on the right of the child to know and to love two primary parents in accordance with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. A marked drop in the use of litigation has been seen in Australia following recent equal parenting reforms in that country. This outcome was expected by advocates of, equally, of equal uh, parenting and runs counter to the scaremongering from opponents who falsely claim that equal shared parenting will produce greater conflict among divorced parents and their children. That simply is not what's happened. Another myth surrounding this bill is that it imposes a cookie cutter, one size fits all outcome on all divorcing families. It doesn't do that. In fact, the opposite is true, Mr. Speaker. The status quo is the cookie cutter approach. With more than 75% of family court custody decisions being in favor of sole custody by the mother. Now that's a cookie cutter approach, Mr. Speaker, and not a healthy one, and not one that I think should be continued in this country. We clearly see the de facto presumption 
in operation in today's family courts. Amending the Divorce Act to include a presumption, a presumption of equal shared parenting, therefore, is not a radical change to the current law. More importantly, it's a change that replaces a parental rights framework for one that prioritizes the best interests of the child or children, Mr. Speaker. The current adversarial litigation system of settling child-related disputes is focused on, par on parental rights. Parents are the ones represented by counsel and are the parties in, in the dispute. Each parent asserts that they are a better parent and are better able to meet the child's need, needs, than, and each parent defends against unfair or mistaken attacks on their parenting from the other parent. As a result, the courts are clogged, Mr. Speaker, with bitter, divisive, and financially devastating custody litigation between parents fighting over children like they are property. I want to also clarify that Bill C-560 does not impose a one-size-fits-all requirement of an exact 50-50 residential arrangement for the children of divorced parents at both parents' new homes. It establishes equal shared parenting as a starting point for parents and courts to use as they work towards a solution, typically in the range of a 35 50 residential access by, by a child to each parent according to the unique circumstances of each family, Mr. Speaker. The international organization Leading Women for Shared Parenting reports that research also proves that although children want a relationship with both of their parents, regardless of the marital status, healthy bonding with a parent is impossible without substantial amounts of time spent in that parent's physical presence. That means very close to equal, Mr. Speaker, and again in the 35 to 50 percent uh, range for each parent. Bill C-560 aims to implement selected best practices from other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker, to encourage parents to make consensual decisions, to reduce conflict and costly legal battles, and also to ensure that both parents have the option of equal time with their children unless proven unfit. Equal time as a starting point in the divorce process means both parents need not fear the arbitrarily the arbitrary loss of their children, Mr. Speaker. And I've got so much more that I want to say, Mr. Speaker, but I see that my time is almost up. I just will close, by, Mr. Speaker, by saying that we know from the best social science research, a body of research that's growing every day, Mr. Speaker, we know that ordinary children thrive most and produce the best outcomes when raised by both of their biological parents, Mr. Speaker. And this is what this bill is about, Mr. Speaker, and I believe it could play a very important role indeed in helping to ensure that that's what happens, that the best rights of the child are, the, the, are, are considered and that that means in most cases near equal uh, access to each of their parents uh, a result which uh, clearly, as I've said before, is in the best interest of the child. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Autrin Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to speak about an issue that I hold dearly, and that is the rights of children. This bill before the House is a serious risk, in my opinion, to the rights of children in Canada, and that's why I want to express my lack of support for the current version of Bill C-560. This bill, which is sponsored by my colleague for Saskatoon, Wotaskwin, would amend the Divorce Act by replacing the idea of a custody order by that of a parenting order. It would require judges to apply the principle of equal sharing of per parenting, except where there is a demonstrated interest in doing things otherwise and in to help the child. This change in the legislation, which seems innocuous at first glance, has major consequences for thousands of families in Canada. 
the main effect of the law, of the new bill, would be to put the parents' interests ahead of the children's interests when there is a parenting order. I feel that it is essential to keep the child's interest as the primary consideration when judges are looking at custody. I also support the Quebec Bar Association's opinion that was issued and it is opposed to Bill C-560. I would like to give the members an indication of what they put in their letter to the member who sponsored this bill. They, I still hope that the member will take into consideration the expertise and the views that are in this letter. The Quebec Bar Association, through its head, has said that the bill is a follow-up version of what was introduced in 2002 and then in 2003 that also called for equal parenting. There were consultations over more than a decade on this issue. In 2001, the Quebec Bar prepared a brief, and the government's final report on custody and child support for children, called the Children First, and another bill were the result of this consultation. And one of the main conclusions from the consultation was that the needs of the children when it comes to custody needed to be uh, more important than the principle of maximum contact. The conclusion was shared by most of those who were consulted and there were many groups and legal experts consulted across Canada. Bill C-560 would amend the Divorce Act and go in the opposite direction to what came out of the consultations in 2001 when it comes to custody in particular because there is this presumption of equal parenting. Why is this bill, therefore, ignoring this decade of consultation? Why is it ignoring the experts? Divorce is difficult, and custody issues are an enormous pressure on families, and especially on children. This bill would force judges to put children's interests after those of the ch parents. This is an important change and it will be harmful to children and their development. Judges already take into consideration the possibility of having equal parenting and equal custody as the best possible solution if the child's interests are taken into consideration. We already have legislative tools to deal with these issues. Canadian judges are skilled and they know how to make a well-considered decision. Given that many situations are conflictual in the event of a divorce, it is just not in the child's interest to see parents sharing equal custody. After all, the children's interests have to be taken into account more than the parents' right to custody. The NDP will always fight for more gender equality so that fathers have e equal rights with mothers, but this bill does not meet its objective. It actually weakens the rights of children. We need also to avoid putting parents in a situation where when they are at their most vulnerable, they take advantage of a legislative change like this. One member of the couple might use custody as a way to attack the other person. This is a selfish response, and it doesn't take into account the interests of the children. This is why I support what the Quebec Bar Association has said, that is, that the children's interests have to take priority. I would like to also 
mention the family law section of the Canadian Bar Association that has also indicated that parents' rights have taken priority in this legislation. The association also has said that the role of parents does not have anything to do with their rights as of the adults, that parenting should be about the children's interests, that this bill is based on a wrong premise and that shared parenting, equal parenting, is not necessarily right for all families in all situations. This change promotes the point of view of parents more than it does that of children, and it will have an impact on children. I hope that my colleagues will also take into consideration these expert views. I would also like to express my concern about two other aspects of this bill. There may be changes made to existing custody orders under the legislation. From what I understand, all custody orders, sole custody orders, can be reviewed by a court and then have to apply the presumption of shared parenting. This gives retroactive power that is inappropriate. We see here an attempt to give priority to a number of, prior of criteria, but less priority to the opinions of the children and family violence. This doesn't make sense because this is not what is done in other Western countries. I would conclude by saying that when parents are concerned about their children more than about themselves, they are probably more likely to look beyond their differences and their own interests and find a solution that works well for their family. Current legislation already gives the possibility of equal parenting if that is in the best interest of the children. Instead of limiting the rights of children, I would call on my colleagues to turn to other more constructive solutions to develop tools and provide resources to families to deal with divorce situations. Because if parents are better equipped, they will be able to make better decisions. Thank you. Uh, before, before I recognize the uh, Honourable Member for uh, Lethbridge, I'll let the Honourable Member know he'll have not the full ten minutes, but in fact about seven minutes left in the time remaining uh, for debate on this question. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And because of the this way with the time, I'll keep my eye on you, and, and uh, you can give me the signal. But I feel like I will be able to talk for the full five to seven minutes or whatever I have on Bill C-560. And I'm speaking in support of the bill, which is the bill to amend the Divorce Act to make equal shared parenting to present an arrangement for children following the divorce of their parents, except in proving cases of abuse or neglect. Now, uh, I must admit that when this bill first became, uh, was, was first tabled and started to get some public attention, and I started to pay attention to it, I was uh, a little bit surprised to see how controversial it became. I expected that most people would be in favor of it. Uh, I guess that's part of the reason why we have this debate, because sometimes assumptions are challenged. And I'll, I'll say that the arguments against the bill um, seem as, as, uh, as sincere as, as um, as those of us who are arguing in favor of it. So I don't want to uh, say anything about the, uh, the malintent of people who disagree with me on this bill. But I will say at, at home, uh, when, when I do um, have uh, the occasional uh, constituent come talk to me about uh, d divorce law and um, family law problems, almost... Well, in fact, without exception, the problems have been fathers feeling like they weren't getting um, 
fair representation through the courts, that the whole system was stacked against fathers having access to their children. Now, I want to make very clear that this bill, or at least my support for this bill, is not about preserving fathers' rights. It's not about mothers' rights. It's about the children's rights, but not just the children's rights, but the good of the children. And we talk about, when we talk about the good of the children, uh, sometimes uh, I wonder why, why we uh, always say, oh, it's the good of the children. Why do, why do children have this emphasis that uh, you know, other human beings don't, don't have? It's not that uh, children are more important, but the children haven't done anything to, to cause the grief that they receive from the mistakes that adults make. And uh, also, children just happen to be the people who turn into to adults who do run the world. And if we uh, have the children's best interest at heart and at, in mind, and we actually look after the children's best interest, by extension, we cannot, we cannot fail in having the best interest of society as a whole. And uh, beyond children in and of themselves, when we have... Are the best interest of families at, at heart and the best interest of families in our minds and we look after the interest of families, we cannot fail but to look after the interest of society because family is the founding unit, the, the fundamental unit of society and when we do harm to the family, we cannot avoid doing harm to society. So whatever decisions we make in this place or uh, any other place that we make decisions for all of society, it must focus on children, and not just children as individuals, but children as parts of families. We live in a time when most men and boys are essentially fatherless. If men and boys are fatherless, so are the daughters. We live in a time when uh, we, we lament uh, violence against women, where we lament um, irresponsibility and uh, we can't teach our boys to treat our uh, women properly without fathers, and we can't, uh, we can't teach our daughters. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to have daughters have a sense of who they are without their fathers as well. Whatever the circumstances, when children do not have a father in the home, they find themselves on their own to figure out life, and they find out that it is a lonely place to be. And they uh, often will be uh, r ruled by their fears and anger and boredom, where lots of times all they seek is the affection of a father. And their many addictions all come out of this fatherless place within them, a fundamental uncertainty in the core of their being. Uh, we, our, our uh, art, our, our literature, our, our poems, our movies, our, our novels, there's so many written about uh, children seeking out their parents, and in particular their fathers. Uh, lots, lots of stories that are uh, real life stories and uh, are about adopted children who at a certain age have an inner angst in their soul to find out who their parents are. They'll, they love their adopted parents and see them as their parents, but there's something inside of our souls that seeks to be connected with our fathers and our mothers. But this bill, of course, is in response to the fact that in today's current divorce law, it is fathers who are usually left out of the children's lives, and by extension, the children are left out of the father's lives. The appeal of fatherhood, what does fatherhood do? What does it teach people in general, kids in general? It's the newfound position as a requirement of the good life. It shows people how to fulfill duty. It binds you to other people in general. It binds you for real to a woman or to, to, an, to another adult. It's the only thing that still can do this. Nowadays, um, marriage is instantly reversible in a negotiable contract, but fatherhood is not. And by this, this law, we will bring fathers closer to the hearts of the children, the children to the fathers. And this bill may not be perfect yet, but it's on the right track. We need to bring it to committee so that we can examine it closer. And the concerns that are 
uh, that people have brought up about this bill can be addressed in committee. We, need, we, do, we cannot let it die at this point. We need to bring it on to the next level. So I encourage everyone in this House to vote in favor of this bill to bring it to committee. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'd like to invite the Honourable Member for Saskatoon, uh, Wanuskewin, uh, for his uh, five-minute uh, right of reply, the Honourable Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I have some conclu concluding comments for the second reading uh, stage of debate on this bill here, and uh, I look forward to this. I look forward to speaking again, hopefully, if this would get into committee and pass at that stage, uh, amended or as intact, um, and then back uh, to the House. Uh, but it has been an interesting process, and over the past several months, I've heard from Canadians uh, coast to coast, from every province, uh, from the Bell Province uh, all the way across to Western Canada and British Columbia. And over the course of the past years, I, in fact, have heard from thousands of individuals, thousands of people. But this bill, I will have to confess right off the get-go here, um, is not my uh, creative imagination, per se. Uh, certainly my uh, carrying the banner, I guess, over these years now. But uh, there are some very significant other groups in the country that are involved in this. Uh, I want to give credit and thank the group called Lawyers for Shared Parenting, a very uh, distinguished group of lawyers who've uh, worked in collaborative law but see that all these other different things that we've tried in the past, the mediation, the various other things that have been tried, have really not got at the core, at the heart of what the problems with the uh, flawed family law system is. I want to also thank the, uh, the organization called National Parents Organization, preserving the bond between parents and children. I want to thank the group Leading Women for Shared Parenting and the very considerable job that they have done, and that number grows by the day, a number of distinguished women across our country and across the world, in fact. And then uh, most, uh, most of all, I want to give thanks to the uh, very broad umbrella group called Canadian Equal Parenting Council, which is, uh, comprises an umbrella group for about, uh, I think it's 35 to 40 different uh, groups across the country. Of, co of course, those all have their own individual chapters, too, so it's a very sizable number of people represented in these groups here. As well, I want to thank all the very many researchers uh, that I have had the privilege to be in touch with, have uh, weighed in on this, have provided input and so on, and certainly will be prepared to come to committee. From, from Canada, from abroad, a uh, large consensus paper just recently written by a bunch of these individuals who uh, have the intellectual heft, if you will, the uh, social science kind of research that's been done. And that is coming at us in an avalanche, my friends. Uh, we now begin to better understand what the best interests of children are, adding, adding already to those uh, different uh, criteria or parameters that there are in the courts across the provinces here. And uh, particularly the fact that children want to love and be loved by both parents. Uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child talks about that very, uh, very necessary thing. Uh, Long-time supporters of the New Democratic a party, the Liberals, the Conservatives, the Bloc Québécois, and the Green Party from every region across this country, uh, those individuals have been calling their elected representative to stand up for the best interests of Canada's children and divorce by voting in favor of Bill C-560. And so, Mr. Speaker, I want to make the point uh, resoundingly that across party lines, across this entire country, the polling over a number of polls over the last years uh, shows that at least 80 percent and upward or just hovering underneath about 79 percent uh, in all provinces by all parties represented in this house and by both genders. In fact, it's uh, slightly more. It's above 80 percent uh, for men and about 80, just about a 1 percent or 2 percent more for women. And you might say, well, why women even more than men supportive of this equal shared parenting uh, bill or this concept? And it's because those men and women marry again or they have another partner and this, this issue of uh, children and their children being able to have access to them of course consumes them and also creates some different dynamics in those relationships as well. It's in fact the current adversarial litigation system of, of settling child related disputes that's focused on parental rights. It's about winning the boat, winning the car, the house, the battle over the children. So the present system is a very adversarial system focused on the rights of the parents whereas this bill is focused on the rights of the children. It will actually foster settlements, reduce the litigation, and so on uh, in the best interests of children. And so my hope, uh, friends, today is that um, we've had discussion about the myth of the 50-50. It's actually a 35 to 50 percent range. Uh, we've talked about um, how this is not a cookie-cutter, cookie, uh, one-size-fits-all, but there are variations, arrangements that can be made. 
but it's to drive it to the best interest of children so that they have access to both mom and dad aside from abuse or neglect. And so I would encourage my colleagues to read some of the good material that's been sent to them. Read the bill itself, not what the Canadian Bar Association is saying about the bill, but rather read the bill. Read the myths and fact document that many of you have been uh, circulated to. And uh, please help me to get this to committee where it can be looked at for further amendments, for adjustments, uh, so that we do the right thing. We do the best interest of children in the days ahead by way of passing this bill. Thank you. La question est la suivante. The question is as follows. Mr. Velikot, seconded by Ms. O'Neill Gordon, moves that Bill C-560, an act to amend the Divorce Act, equal parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts, be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Yes. All those in favor of the motion will please say yea. Yay! All those opposed will please say nay. Yay! In my opinion, the nays have it. Pursuant, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 93, the division stands deferred until Wednesday, May 28th, tomorrow, 2014, immediately before the time provided for private members' business.